Okay, the next portion of training which we're going to dive into is a review of contemporary legal issues in policing. Uh, the benefit that I have from my current employment is I get to travel the country and deal with multiple police departments from multiple different states and to see how they interact and how each of them are dealing with the issues that we're going to bring forward. Now, contemporary legal issues, what does that mean? Well, it means these are the issues that are affecting you in law enforcement right now. These are the areas where we are uh, under tight scrutiny and these are the areas where we need to ensure that you as the officers and the department through its policy standards are ensuring correct application of the law so to prevent you from having liability concerns and to prevent the department from having additional liability concerns. So let's dive right into this. The topics which we're going to discuss are going to be use of force. And we're going to transition to the focus on technology and daily operations. And then we also want to dive into current trends in policing, such as bias-based policing, stop and frisk standards, investigatory stops, American with Disability Act and its application. So if you bear with me, I'm going to throw a whole bunch at you in the form of little snippets from each of these um, high liability, high frequency issues that we're seeing across the country to hopefully put you in a better area in a better position to address uh, as, you, uh, as you come across them. I have to say as a general overall that policies and training of a department are the most important liability protectors there are next to supervision. Um, the policies and procedures of your department reflect and express the core values and priorities and provide clear direction to ensure that officers lawfully, effectively, and ethically carry out their law enforcement responsibilities. Listen, it's update training and as a result it gives me the opportunity to say when's the last time that you read the policies and procedures of your department? Even if it's solely the high liability, high frequency ones. You need to know what they say. You need to know what your guidelines and directions are so that you, one, can follow them and provide and, and ensure that you're not uh, placing yourself into um, a disciplinary problem. And also, when it comes to liability, the first thing that's going to be brought up in litigation is what was the policy of your agency and did you follow it or didn't you follow it? If the policy is clear and the agency has said it, uh, their liability is protected if you don't follow it, if you do something outside the scope of your policy. So my request to you, in order to best protect yourself in this area of liability in which transparency is so important nowadays, take the time and review your policies. What are we trying to prevent here? Well, the whole scope of everything that we're talking about comes down to preventing deliberate indifference. Under federal 1983 law, that's 42 U.S.C. section 1983, which is the civil rights statute in which violation of that imposes a constitutional violation on you as officers, the important part here is for us to identify what deliberate indifference is and how to protect it. The courts have identified deliberate indifference is demonstrated when the inadequacy is so obvious and so likely to result in the violation of constitutional rights that the policymakers can reasonably be said to have been deliberately indifferent. We know what it is. It's a choice made among various alternatives, a knowing choice, usually made with some state of mind, a choice made with some knowledge or appreciation of what the consequences of the choice will or might be. Listen, Deliberate indifference is a very low standard. That is, it doesn't take much to protect yourself. Follow your policies, follow your trainings, supervisors, supervise your employees, and administrators ensure that the policy, training, and applications of uh, operations are effective and constitutional. Well, let's start with the first topic. And what's the first topic? Well, it's always got to be the same, which is force and use of force. Listen, reality is this. When it comes to high frequency, high liability events, use of force garners the most attention. It, 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 we have media attention, internal affairs investigations, liability and litigation. And you know what? It's not going to get any better. So how do we address it? We're not going to stop using force when lawfully able to do so. 
and when that force is objectively reasonable. In order to ensure that we're all consistent on the application of force, it's important that we understand your force policy, ensure that your training on the policy and on the application of force is clear, and the follow-up, which we'll talk about, is to ensure that supervisors are doing force investigations. As you see on the screen, there's a bunch of photographs. All of them are force incidents across the country that have occurred probably within the past two years. Realistic issue is this. I've never seen a force incident that looks good. As a result, it always attracts a lot of attention. What are we going to do about that? Well, we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to make sure that we understand, just as a refresher, the Graham versus Connor standards of objective reasonableness. Now listen, I'm not going to go through the case because your use of force instructors do a much better job than that. But I want you to remember, if nothing else, what the holding and the specific verbiage utilized by the court in Graham versus Connor. Now, as a big fan of this holding, uh, especially when it comes to jury trials, because this sets forth what that, quote, objectively reasonable standard means. In Graham versus Connor, we have understand a few things. First, that the court determined that Fourth Amendment establishes the legal standard for use of force claims during an arrest, a detention, or other seizure. Fourth Amendment is the right of people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. The reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. Remember, even the court said, but it's not being interpreted quite the way we'd like to see, not every push or shove, even if it may later seem unnecessary, in the peace of the judge's chamber violates the Fourth Amendment. The calculus of reasonableness must allow for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. The reasonableness test in an excessive force case during an arrest, detention, or seizure is an objective one. The question is whether the officer's actions were, quote, objectively reasonable in the light of the existing facts and circumstances without regard to their underlying intent or motivation. Okay, when analyzing objective reasonableness, the court has, has given us a guide. The guide is, the test of reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment is not capable of precise definition or mechanical application. That's a good guide, isn't it? Well, listen, facts make force reasonable. There is no perfect answer. However, I can't stress enough to every one of you, every time I see you from now until the day your career ends, facts and circumstances justify the need to use force. You have to make sure your reports are clear and detailed as to what you did, what you saw, what the suspect did, what your commands were, what the reactions were. All of these areas provide you the ability to answer important questions. You know, the reality of force, as a lot of you have heard me say before, is it comes down to the same three questions. Yes, they're objective questions in the aspect of, listen, you, when you write your report, need to answer these questions. You, when you're deciding what force to use, need to answer these questions. Your supervisor, in determining whether or not your force was within policy or not within policy, needs to answer these questions. And your attorney, when they're defending your actions, will utilize the same questions if somebody alleges an excessive force application. What's the questions? Well, they're listed here in 1, 2, and 3. I like to do it the same way as the Chu decision from the Ninth Circuit did, which is 2, 3, 1, but I'll do them in order. First, number one, how serious was the offense that the officer suspected at the time that the officer used force? The more serious the offense, the greater the need for apprehension, thus the greater level of force that may be used. Now listen, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, this question wasn't as prominent in force analysis. Now and recently, especially the court decisions regarding the use of the electronic control weapon have really started to analyze what was the underlying crime at the time in which the taser was utilized. Number two, and this is one that most officers get very well, 
Uh, did the suspect pose a threat to the officer or any other person present? I have always found that officers are very good at articulating what the threat was. Number three, was the suspect actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight? Now, that's a very simple question. Was the subject actively resisting? But it's open-ended, and therefore, it's your job to utilize facts and circumstances to fill the void of what is active resistance. Now, we could spend a lot of time in all sorts of use of force training talking about the application and the decision the decision making or the decision point analysis but the purpose of this training I'm gonna focus on the backside I'm gonna focus on use of force reporting and why use of force reporting is so important well I put the question to you why is it important what are your responsibilities in force reporting uh, as applies to the officer as applies to the agency as applies to the citizens as applies to the community as it applies to the law enforcement profession as a whole or how about as it applies to yourself the point that I'm trying to make is this the quality of your case is stemmed 100 percent from your use of force reporting if your reporting is terrible then the case can never get any better and even six years later when we're defending that case in court we only have what you did at the time that the incident occurs so we really want everybody to focus on the quality of their force reporting. Let's focus on the purposes for use of force reporting and the reason why, if you don't believe my request to do it, why you should. First, it establishes the foundation for use of force justification and investigation. Force reporting is an instrument by which officers explain and justify the reason for their use of force in a particular situation and also it provides the agency with timely information concerning use of force incidents. For supervisors, it's a mean to ensure compliance with use of force policy through post-incident evaluation of an officer's actions, and it's the supervisor's responsibility to ensure that the officer's report is clear and descriptive as to the facts and circumstances. Supervisors, I'm directly asking you to help me out in this regard, and that is don't accept reports that are not meeting the requirements of the Graham standards when force is used for the initial application and every application of force during the interaction with the subject. If they're not there, kick it back, make them redo it. Early intervention systems. We look at the numbers when it comes to force in multiple projects across the country. Uh, the use of force is a key performance indicator that is used to identify at-risk officers and correct, correct problematic behaviors. I don't use this as a negative. What I use is that there are certain jobs in police departments which just ensure or put you in situations where you're going to use more force than everybody else. Therefore, we need to make sure that you are properly trained. We need to make sure that your force reporting is as good as it can be because we know that your likelihood of having problems or litigation is high. Training component. A perfect aspect of force reporting is the ability to use the force documentation to enhance the officer's learning based on an evaluation of the reports describing field incidents. How do you learn from new situations? Well, you utilize the report and you have a group training, you utilize the video, you utilize the body video, you use whatever you have to ensure that everybody understands uh, what occurred and how to either uh, do it better or to meet the standards of the department policy. Use of force data is used to identify patterns or trends that may indicate training needs, equipment upgrades, and or policy modifications. Times change continuously and we have to adapt and overcome. And what does that mean? Well, we have to look at what, what the data is telling us and determine whether or not the policy is sufficient, the equipment is sufficient, and or the training is sufficient. And if it isn't, we need to mold with it and modify what we're doing. We look at whether certain officers use more force than others, what kinds of force is being used in the department, under what circumstances officers use force, what's the frequency of the use of force, and what is the officer's civilian injury resulting from the force that's used. And finally, lawsuits and community support. 
It's critical that departments ensure and be able to document that its officers employ only that level of force that is reasonably necessary to control a situation. Agencies that are in a much better position to defend themselves against charges of excessive force if they document the types of situations in which their officers have used force. Let's talk about force reporting. Hopefully you have a use of force reporting policy which guides you as to what is required on a use of force. Hopefully you have an independent force reporting system or a document which you, which you fill out in, in addition to your incident report. What are the things that we're looking for in these force reportings? Well, first, a detailed account of the incident from the officer's perspective. Second, the reason for the initial police presence. Third, a specific description of the acts that led to the use of force. Fourth, the level of resistance encountered. And fifth, a description of every type of force that was used during the incident. A use of force reporting policy shall explicitly prohibit the use of canned or conclusory language in all reports documenting use of force. Now listen, officers and supervisors, what do I mean by canned or conclusory language? Well, words that we don't know the meaning of. He was assaultive. He was aggressive. Well, what does that mean? I need facts and circumstances to help explain what the, what the officer saw, what the suspect did, and therefore we can justify the force that was used. Supervisors, you have a unique response also when it comes to force reporting. Um, most policies across the country request and require supervisors to respond to the scene of force investigations. Uh, not all departments are up to speed on that, and that is what we call a common police practice. So if you're not, uh, it's something that you might want to bring back to the department. When supervisors are notified of a use of force, he or she shall respond on a priority basis to do the following. What do I want a supervisor to do at the scene to help make the case as defendable as possible? Well, I'd like the supervisor to conduct a preliminary investigation into the use of force. Document as necessary the scene of the incident, a visible inspection of the officers and the subjects for injuries, and again, that would also include photographs, photographs of injuries, photographs even if there are no injuries. Interview the subjects for complaint of pain. And one of the most important areas is ensure that the subject receives needed medical attention if that's the case. In a use of force incident, it is not a one-dimensional or two-dimensional environment. It is a three-dimensional environment, especially in the new age where video is becoming uh, popular. Unfortunately, it's not all good video because it comes from angles or far away and we're looking or we're only seeing portion of what's occurring. In determining a force incident uh, is justified or not justified, the evidence that's necessary uh, needs to be a full circle. Physical evidence, backgrounds, scientific analysis if necessary, statements, videos, records, interviews, witness observations. Remember, Videos are all are but one element of the investigation. Videos do not always tell the entire story. All components of an investigation need to be explored and exhausted. If any of you have been to my use of force training, we're not going to get into it right now, but I will I identify what I call phases of a use of force event. It's important that officers tell the story from the beginning to the end, and as I've said 50 times, if not two, facts and circumstances. The report should be divided into four areas. What's the initial assessment? What did you know on the way there? What did you see when you got there? Contact and observation. What was your overall observations? Had you been there before? Do you know the subject? What did you see? What do you know? Action and dialogue. What did you give as commands? What were the responses? What were the steps that you took? What was said by you? what was said by him. And final stages, the decision to use force. Did it meet the Graham standards? What was the severity of the crime? Identify the threat. Subject was actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight. Going through a detailed oriented way of writing your force reports the same way every time will ensure that you're writing them as complete to offer you the most protection.
All right, let's transition to technology and law enforcement. And this is a huge subject that I actually have a full class on, but I want to touch on the highlighted parts for you because if you're not going to get to a full class, you at least should know the areas that you should be concerned about. What are we talking about here? Well, Fourth Amendment, First Amendment protections, video and photographing police officers, viewing and listening to evidence, cell phones and the information contained on cell phones, seizing technologies from citizens, and evidence on recording devices. All of these areas have been very hot topic items over the past year or two. In fact, if you look on the publication section of Daigle Law Group, you will see multiple arguments. I think we did about five in a row solely on technology, cell phones, seizing them, giving up the information, all the issues uh, associated with cell phones. Let's start with the employment related aspect, and that is use of technology in your daily work as a law enforcement officer. Technology has a large impact in law enforcement daily operation, but we actually don't want to talk about it. We don't talk about it. How many of you are using personally owned technology in your day to day activity as a police officer? How many of you are using your cell phone, your iPads, your computers, uh, whatever you have, uh, you're using while on duty? Well, the question is, what's the, what's the protection associated with those items? We're going to talk about the assignment of department-owned technology, the use of privately-owned cellular telephones while on duty, and we're not going to talk about it in this update, but if you haven't taken a preview of what's going on in the social networking application by officers, you probably should. Again, there's some publications online that will bring you up to speed. The next topic that we want to discuss is use of personal cell phones while on duty. For years I've been giving cautions to police officers as I've watched technology develop and concerned that the, the legal implications or the legal analysis of our use of technology just hasn't caught up with our actual use. And I've always said to officers, listen, just be careful. Yes, my interpretation is that if you use your personal cell phone, personal computer, personal laptop in the course of your duties, that I think there is an argument that it is open for analysis. It's open for subpoena. Well, that all came to a head when this case, State of, State of New Mexico versus Ortiz, came out. The defendant, Marty Ortiz, was indicted for DWI. And as you can see, this is from the State of New Mexico. Uh, during the hearing, the defendant sought to prove that the stop of his vehicle conducted by the officer was pretextual and illegal. He filed a motion to suppress the evidence against him. The defend defendant also filed a motion to compel specific discovery regarding phone records of any kind which were relevant to the stop and the arrest, including any communications between the officer and any dispatcher, police officer, or any other person whatsoever. Now, it turned out that the officer had utilized his cell phone, personal own, during the course of the, uh, the DUI stop to call the station, to call a supervisor. When that information came out, the prosecutor for the case strongly objected to the discovery request for the officer's personal cell phone records. The district court granted the request showing that the phone records were material to the defense of this case. The state refused to produce the records, and as a result, because the prosecutor did not want to produce the officer's uh, cell phone records for his personal phone, the case was dismissed. Uh, the appellate court found no basis in which the state is permitted to assert an officer's privacy right to excuse the state from investigating the relevance and materiality of the defense of an on-duty investigating officer's cell phone records that is within the state control. The court found no basis on which the state is excused from producing those documents. As the number of officers carrying and utilizing their personal cell phones while on duty increases, the clever defense attorneys begin to realize the potential evidentiary value of those cell phone records and issue subpoenas on a more prevalent basis. This particular topic will step well into the spotlight. We recommend that officers put a wall between them and their personal owned electronics. Let's transition into the Fourth Amendment application of technology. And really, we're looking at the reasonable expectation of privacy. It is my opinion in review of the case, across, case law across the country that there are only a few items in this share everything world 
that have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And I often ask recruit classes when we're talking as to the basics of Fourth Amendment application, hey, what is our reasonable expectation of privacy in today's world? And the fact that we share everything, the more we share, the less the expectation of privacy is. There are still a few items that hold a very strong expectation of privacy. That is your house, as we talked about in training before. And that is the very clear case law that says, you know, the four walls of the house, you cross the threshold without a search warrant or an exception to the search warrant application is a Fourth Amendment violation. I also think that a person, the body of a person, has a high expectation of privacy. You know, the search of that person for blood, uh, fluids, fingerprints, hairs, all items requires a search warrant uh, to get that done. Based on the case law, I'm going to push a little bit further ahead and say, I think cell phones are becoming a very important area when analyzing a reasonable expectation of privacy. In, in fact, my direct opinion to you, take it for what it's worth, talk to your own prosecutors, is I would not search a cell phone without a search warrant. Why? Because what's contained on today's cell phones, medical records, photographs, links to people's houses, videos, uh, whatever the other things that are bank records, all of these things only enhance an argument of an individual who claims that these are a reasonable expectation of privacy. Remember there's a two-part test for reasonable expectation of privacy. That is that the one, the person must exhibit an actual subjective expectation of privacy and two, that the expectation must be one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. This inquiry takes into account all relevant circumstances surrounding the actions in question. Well, let's talk about how this affects the area of videotaping and photographing police officers. If you follow any social media or any news stories regarding the issues associated with law enforcement, photographing and videotaping officers is one that got a lot of attention. We as law enforcement must strive to seek an appropriate balance between protecting officers and enabling them to perform their duties without interference. Ensuring a degree of transparency to enable the public to retain their confidence in those whom sworn duty it is to serve and protect. There's a couple cases that highlight this and the first one is a case uh, that came out last year in Glick versus Kniff which is a Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts case. It's a First Circuit ruling. And what happened here is, let me give you a fact pattern and you tell me how this is going to work for you. So, uh, an individual is, is being, you as officers are arresting an individual. And while arresting the individual, you and your partner, the individual is, quote, actively resisting. That is, he is not complying with your verbal commands. He is not giving his hands. He is swinging and kicking and punching. And therefore, you sooner or later take him into control, into custody, and you secure him. You look up and you see 20 feet away an individual who has a cell phone pointed at you, who is recording this incident. Now, what's the steps that you're going to take from here? Is there a protection to the individual who has recorded that, uh, that prevents you from seizing that cell phone or seizing that video? And the answer is yes. The process is a different story. It is my recommendation uh, to all law enforcement agencies that you set forth a clear standard as to how to obtain those cell phones. Now let's arguably say this. Let's say that that cell phone uh, contains evidence of a crime. What was the crime? Well, let's just say that evident, the cell phone video may show interfering, may show an assault on an officer. Are you going to want to seize that video? Are you going to want to seize that cell phone? Are you going to let the subject that recorded the video just walk away? You know, the answer to those is probably yes, yes, and no. The process is what's causing us a problem across the country. We want to clearly identify the issues and set a proper standard for conducting the seizure. So, in, in the Glick case, the, the court set some very strong language that obviously it's not binding on you if you're not in the First Circuit, but you should take it as, uh, as 
a lesson, if nothing else. The court said that officers were unhappy that they were being recorded during an arrest. That does not make a lawful exercise of a First Amendment right a crime. The court found no probable cause supporting the wiretap charges that Mr. Glick was arrested on, and the officers admitted that Glick had used his cell phone openly and in plain view to obtain video and audio recordings. The court said that the First Amendment goes beyond the protection of the press and the, and the self-expression of individuals to prohibit government from limiting the stock of information from which members of the public may draw. It is well established that the Constitution protects the right to receive information and ideas. There is an undoubted right to gather news from any source by means within the law. Gathering information about government officials in a form that can be readily disseminated to others serves a cardinal First Amendment interest in protecting and promoting the free discussion of governmental affairs. Now, in our society, police officers are expected to endure significant burdens caused by citizens' exercise of their First Amendment right. The First Amendment protects a significant amount of verbal criticism and challenge directed at a police officer. The court says that the same restraint demanded of law enforcement officers in the face of provocative and challenging speech must be expected when they are merely the subject of videotaping that memorializes without impairing their work in public spaces. Such peaceful recordings of an arrest in a public space that does not interfere with the police officer's performance of their duties is not reasonably subject to limitation. The next issue that came up with this transparency comes from a case out of uh, Maryland, Sharp versus the City of Baltimore Police Department. Now, in this case, this case became unique because the Department of Justice uh, interdicted themselves into this case and they issued a letter sending guidance across the country to law enforcement as to how to handle in the seizing of cameras from an individual who has recorded police conduct. I strongly recommend if you're in the command of police departments to go to the Department of Justice Special Litigation website, search under cases and uh, review the copy of the Sharp Letter. Let me give you the Reader's Digest version. And that at the clubhouse of the race, co race course, the plaintiff Christopher Sharp observed Baltimore City Police Department officers forcefully arresting his friend. He used his cell phone camera to video and audio record the officer's conduct. Several officers in succession approached Mr. Sharp and ordered him to surrender his camera. After twice refusing to comply with officer demands, Mr. Sharp surrendered his phone to an officer who indicated that he needed to review and possibly copy Mr. Sharp's recording as evidence. The officer went around the corner, and when he came back, the officer returned Mr. Sharp's cell phone, uh, and he ordered Mr. Sharp to leave the premises. As he left, he looked at his cell phone and saw that the officer had reset the phone and deleted all of the recordings on his cell phone, including two recordings of his friend's arrest and at least 20 personal videos. The personal videos included recordings of his young son at sporting events. Uh, his cell phone had, be had been reset by police officers only to a permitted to allow emergency calls. The litigation occurred and the issues that came in this litigation was whether private citizens have a First Amendment right to record police officers in the public discharge of their duties and whether an officer violates the citizens' Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights when they seize and destroy such recordings without a warrant or due process. The letter that was issued as a result of the Sharp versus City of Baltimore incident finds the following quotes. The right to record the right to record police officers while performing duties in a public place, as well as the right to be protected from the warrantless seizure and destruction of those recordings, are not only, requi are not only required by the Constitution, but they are consistent with our fundamental notions of liberty. They promote the accountability of our governmental officers and instill public confidence in the police officers who serve us daily. The Department of Justice letter clarified to police departments that, that they should have policies that affirmatively set forth the First Amendment right to record police officers. Policies should describe the range of prohibited responses, and let me make it clear to all of you, 
Under the First Amendment, there are no circumstances under which the contents of a camera or recording device should be deleted or destroyed. If, in fact, you're allowed to copy it, you must give it back to the subject and the copy of the video must be, re must be still available to the subject on his phone. Uh, there should be general orders that clearly indicate language to prohibit the deletion or destructions of recordings under any and all circumstances. So the question now is, how do we go about getting the camera from the subject who just recorded you and your partners making that arrest? My first recommendation is to make sure a sergeant uh, comes to the scene. Why? Because maybe a supervisor may be better able to explain to the individual why uh, the, ca the camera should be turned over. So what are the options? You can request the citizens voluntarily provide the device or recording medium. Where possible and practical in the presence of the officer, you can ask the individual to transmit the image or sound via text or email to a governmental electronic mail account. You can request a citizen consent to the officer taking possession of the recording device. You can request a citizen to accompany the officer or the supervisor to the department to copy. And if the citizen declines to consent or voluntarily provide the device or recording medium, the officer and the officer believes that exigent circumstances exist insofar as the evidence of criminal activity will be lost absent a seizure of the device without a warrant, a supervisor shall be called. Warrantless seizure is permitted only if there is probable cause to believe that the property holds contraband or evidence of a crime and the existence of the circumstances demand it or other recognized exceptions to the warrant requirement is present. Even if there is authority for a warrantless seizure, it is still recommended that a search warrant be obtained in order to search the phone to obtain the video. All right, let's transition to accepting citizen complaints because this is also a very hot topic item. In fact, in Connecticut, and I recommend all of you take a look at it, uh, the ACLU recently did a survey last year in December of 2012, and the, the headlines in the newspaper was that some Connecticut police departments making complaint process intimidating. The ACLU found that in Connecticut, a filing of a civilian complaint against police is a daunting and at times intimidating process. The American Civil Liberties Union of Connecticut has concluded after surveying more than 100 police agencies. This, uh, again, it's online. You can Google it. I would just Google ACLU survey in Connecticut. Uh, you will find that what they did here is they called up over 100 agencies in the state of Connecticut. The ACLU did. They uh, asked to speak to a supervisor, and they asked the supervisor three questions. Will you accept an anonymous complaint? Will you accept a third-party complaint? And if I'm an illegal immigrant, will you accept my complaint? Unfortunately, some of the departments and some of the supervisors that were uh, interviewed did not answer those questions correctly. And in fact, this study uh, or this report identifies exactly what was said by how, by who and how. Uh, makes for some interesting reading. That shouldn't happen to us at all in this country. The acceptance of citizen complaints, it's a very clear standard. In fact, most of your department should have policies uh, that set in place how and when citizen complaints will be accepted. Listen, we must take citizen complaints uh, all complaints against department and our employees' conduct shall be accepted and documented, regardless of whether the complaint filed is in writing, verbally, in person, by mail, by telephone, by facsimile, by electronics, or anonymously. We will take a complaint anyway, anyhow, anywhere, anytime, and we will investigate it. That is common police practice in the, in the industry to ensure effective and constitutional policing. We're not afraid. We will take the complaint. You as an officer, you as a supervisor, have a duty to take a complaint when an individual wants to file one and make it go through the process. Uh, your policy should say that the department shall accept and fairly 
and impartially investigate all complaints or allegations of misconduct to determine their validity. Department shall timely impose any discipline or non-disciplinary corrective action that may be warranted. Uh, the general principles regarding citizen complaints and internal affairs process is this. All citizens have the right to lodge a complaint against a police officer. Officers may not discourage anyone from making a complaint. Officers must courteously inform individuals of the right to make a complaint. Officers have a duty to assist individuals in filing a complaint by providing them whatever document you have available to file a complaint. That's a brochure or a complaint form. No officer shall refuse to assist any person who wishes to file a citizen complaint or discourage, interfere with, hinder, delay, or obstruct a person from making a citizen complaint. Officers who withhold information, fail to cooperate with departmental investigations, or who fail to report the misconduct of members to a supervisor shall be subject to disciplinary action. This is what the standards of the industry are. This is what your policy should say. Let's transition to another hot topic, which is suicidal suspects. Uh, the issue of mental illness, the issue of force used during, on individuals with mental illness, including issues such as excited delirium and the application of force that lead to in custody deaths are causing us to pay attention to the standards in the industry to ensure that we have proper policy and response in line. Uh, what do we know? Well, there's a great IACP article in the Police Chief uh, magazine for June 2013. You can see it online. In the article, it quotes that in 2008, the Bureau of Justice Assistance reports that 3 to 7 percent of all calls for service from police departments result from factors uh, or individuals that are directly related to mental illness. What does that tell us? Three to seven percent of all law enforcement calls are directly related to individuals suffering from some form of mental illness. That means that we need to make sure that our policy, training, and application are in order because that's a consistency within the within law enforcement community. As such, we recommend a few things to assist you and protect you in uh, dealing with mental illness and use of force that's going to occur. First, the department should establish clear policies in handling suicidal and or mentally ill suspects. Um, you must be knowledgeable in the laws in your jurisdiction and the resources available. You must be knowledgeable of what the standards in your jurisdiction are regarding uh, who you can commit and, and how you can commit them. And also, what are the resources available to you to use when dealing with individuals who are suffering from mental illness? Training is necessary. That is, it's necessary to equip officers with effective interaction skills when encountering suicidal suspects. What should we be training each other on? Well, we got to know something about suicidal behavior. What are the signs and the symptoms? Because we know one thing. Suicidal individuals and mental illness leads to unpredictability. How about excited delirium? What are the signs and response procedures? How are you going to handle an individual who is exhibiting the signs of excited delirium? What we do know in all of the force incidents involving mentally ill individuals is that it's the, not the usual rules of engagement. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, verbal commands aren't going to work because you're not going to get the compliance that required. We know that it's not the usual rules of engagement. What does that mean? Well, we know that individuals with mental illness don't usually respond to verbal commands. They don't usually follow the orders of the officers. And they may fight back even more when the use of soft hands or hard hands application occurs. Crisis intervention training. This is becoming common in law enforcement practices to ensure that we train the officers on how to properly handle and respond to suicidal suspects. In 2013, my opinion in working with multiple agencies across the country is that we need to really start focusing on our partnerships. Where possible, law enforcement should partner with other disciplines when responding to calls that require expertise and services beyond their, com their competence or duties. What does that mean? Well, partnerships with mental health professionals, 
counselors, victim advocates, doctors, physicians, clergies, and other. Listen, I've watched law enforcement for 20 years assign tasks to police officers which they're not qualified to handle. Are we qualified to make determinations as to mental illness, as to suicide? Well, we probably are based on our experience and training, but what we should be doing is providing protection and coverage to the professionals that are responding to give their professional opinion based on their training, education, and experience. We also recommend the use of debriefings. Consider the legal implications, though, of everybody sitting around talking about what happened. Uh, there's a tactical debriefing, there's an operational debriefing, and a critical incident stress managed debriefing. Um, it's important that you uh, and the other officers you work with really break down incidents after they occur to see how they were handled and how they could be handled better in the future. The next area of discussion is bias-based policing. This has become a hot button topic even as recently as the past couple of weeks. In fact, over the past couple of years here in Connecticut, we've seen an increase based on the Department of Justice investigation that's occurring in one of our police departments. We need to ensure that we understand what bias-based policing is and how to ensure that we're not conducting any type of stops which are based on race, ethnicity, or religion. So let's start by just understanding what the definition is. People often use the terms bias-based policing without actually understanding what the interpretation or definition is. The use of bias-based profiling, i.e. the practice of using race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, economic status, age, culture group, or some other identifiable common trait of a group as the sole reason for stopping, detaining, searching pedestrians and motorists, and an acid seizure and forfeiture efforts is prohibited. Everybody has a role in preventing bias-based policing, so let's start with the role of the supervisor. Traffic enforcement, detention, and search procedures will be accompanied by periodic supervisory oversight to ensure that officers do not go beyond the parameters of reasonableness and lawfulness in conducting such activities. Supervisors should be paying attention to the stops that are occurring, the detentions that are occurring, and the searches that are occurring by their officers. How do we prevent allegations of bias-based policing? Honestly, in law enforcement, I think we have looked at many years of ensuring the protection of not conducting bias-based policing. But there's only one way to ensure that we don't and that is the proper recording of motor vehicle stops. Uh, motorists and pedestrians should only be subject to stops and seizures or detentions upon reasonable suspicion that they have committed, are committing, or about to commit an offense. Often the question that's asked when attempting to identify or clarify whether bias-based policing is occurring is what was the reason for the stop? And officers need to do a good job in their CAD entries, in their tickets, on the radio, of articulating why they are stopping an individual. Let's look at detentions and searches. No motorist, once cited or warned, shall be detained beyond the point where there exists no reasonable suspicion of further criminal activity. And no person or vehicle shall be searched in the absence of a warrant, a legally recognized exception to the warrant requirement, or the person's voluntary consent. Let's talk about pretext traffic stops. Officers may stop a motorist whom they have probable cause to believe has committed a traffic violation. An officer's subjective motive for stopping the vehicle plays no role in determining whether or not probable cause exists, even if the stop of the motorist was a pretext to conduct a criminal investigation. However, motor vehicle stops, including pretext stops, are prohibited when based solely on race ethnicity, gender, age, or sexual orientation, or any combination therein. It is important in 2013, and why I put it in this training module, that we cover and understand what bias-based policing is. The standards across the industry for training are identified as follows. Training should include officer safety, courtesy, cultural diversity, discrimination and bias-based profiling, field contacts, traffic stops, and the laws governing search and seizure and interpersonal communication skills. 
Training shall address the issues pertaining to the practice of racial profiling, including its impact on police and society. Training programs will need to emphasize the need to respect the rights of all citizens to be free from unreasonable government intrusion or police action. What are the corrective measures? And we know this very clearly in Connecticut since the law has recently come out that requires uh, us to advise motorists that they have the right to file a complaint if they believe they've been stopped under profiling. Well, corrective measures can clarify. Any person may file a complaint if they feel they have been stopped or searched based on bias-based profiling. And no person shall be discouraged, intimidated, or coerced from filing such a complaint or discriminated against because they have filed such a complaint. All complaints shall be investigated and corrective measures shall be taken if it is determined that bias-based policing has occurred. Supervisors who receive official complaints shall follow department procedures as outlined in the department citizen complaint process. When backing up officers on vehicle stops and other calls, supervisors shall be alert to any pattern or practice of possible discriminatory treatment or bias-based profiling by the officer. Let's transition bias-based policing into the stop and frisk process which is currently under analysis. Now if you've been paying attention at all, you'll know that on August 12, 2013, a federal judge found that the controversial stop and frisk tactics used by the New York Police Department to search individuals for drug paraphernalia and guns violated the constitutional rights of thousands of New Yorkers. The judge noted that the policy which allows officers to briefly detain a person if they have reasonable suspicion that the person is in the process of committing or is about to commit a crime goes too far. It also permits pat-downs if the officer feels that he or she is in danger. The judge's ruling states that NYPD should revise their policies and training modules relating to stop and frisk and racial profiling to ensure that race may only be considered where the stop is based on a specific and reliable suspect description. Police officers must also revise the paperwork used for recording the stops, recording the narrative portion in activity logs. The city has argued that the law has led to a significant reduction in crime, but the judge has said that that's irrelevant when it comes to the laws of constitutionality. Here's my take, and that is, we can't react to this judge's ruling at this point because this is going to be appealed and the appeal is going to have to determine whether or not the standards we understand in Terry versus Ohio are going to be upheld or changed. Now why we all are watching this ruling and I encourage you all to go online and read the judge's ruling which does a very significant uh, analysis of the numbers of stops, the numbers of searches, and the amount of times that a search has actually provided uh, evidence of a crime. And they lay it out pretty clear. There are things that we need to be aware of, and one of them is this. In New York City, the ACLU has put, a, put an app together, which is called the Stop and Frisk Watch. It's a free, innovative app that goes for smartphones and iPhones. And the purpose of it is to monitor the New York City Police Department and hold them accountable for unlawful st stop and frisk encounters or other police misconduct. There are three functions to this app. That is, once the app is activated by the, by the citizen, it records, it listens, and it reports directly to the ACLU servers. This technology is in New York and it's in Los Angeles and we can assume that this technology will continue to grow across the country. What's important here? Well, those items, the videos and the recordings, are not saved on the individual cell phone. They go right to the servers for the ACLU. Yes, we know there's a bit of instability across the country regarding stop and frisk applications. So what you're gonna say to me is, Eric, where do we go from here? And I'm gonna say back to the basics. The standards of Terry versus Ohio. The Fourth Amendment prohibition on unreasonable searches and seizure when the officer briefly detains an individual for investigative purposes if the officer has a reasonable suspicion that the subject has committed 
is committing or is about to commit a crime. Furthermore, for their own protection, an officer may conduct a quick pat-down search or frisk of the subject if the officer has a reasonable belief that the subject may be armed and presently dangerous. Be sure to recall and remember that there are two parts to the stop and frisk standard. The first is the stop under articulable reasonable suspicion and there is a pause and a separation in the search. It's not an automatic just because you stop you get the ability to search. There must be again additional reasonable suspicion articulated to explain why you believe uh, this individual is a threat of harm to you or someone else. Looking at Terry versus Ohio, remember the officer's reasonable suspicion must be based on specific and articulable facts and not merely based on the officer's hunch. Well, specific and articulable facts. Suspicion requires that the investigating officer be able to point to specific and identifiable facts which taken together with rational inferences from those facts provide a particularized and objective basis for suspecting that the criminal activity is afoot. There are limits to the stop though and these are areas where we want to enhance in training what you're allowed and not allowed to do. First is the length of detention. The stop is limited in as to a time and place which that is that the stop lasts no longer than necessary to carry out the purpose of the detention and the subject is not free to leave. Again, officer's ability to move a detained subject. Remember, there's no such thing as a Terry transportation. Once you stop the individual, you cannot remove that individual from that location if the reason for the stop is under a Terry stop. It must occur there. And again, to conclude everything we've talked about in both bias-based policing and the stop and frisk issues, articulation, articulation, articulation. I need to see and understand as all lawyers will analyzing this, what is the reason for the stop? And if you do that, if you justify the reason this stuff by clear factual articulation, there will be a clear limit on the ability to allege that you have conducted pretextual stops. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this training today, and we look forward to the opportunity to be able to bring additional training to you in the future. Our motto here at Daga Law Group is that you have enough work to do in protecting us and keeping us safe. It's our job to interpret the law and the situations across the country to give you some guidance on how to do your daily job, how to protect yourself and maintain liability protection while keeping yourself safe. We hope that you follow us uh, on any of the social medias, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't registered for our publication, we produce a document about every two or three weeks on whatever the hot topic is in the industry. You can register for that by going directly on to dagolawgroup.com and on the bottom corner you'll see an entry where you put your name and your email and that will automatically sign you up for the newsletter. As always, if you have any questions that you got from today's training or just in general, please reach out to us. Easiest way is info at dagolawgroup.com.